Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest in our Beyond Pulse Inside Coach webinars here today. We have Miss Sui Smith, um, a dear friend of mine and, and a, a personal mentor, interesting conversation that we're, we're going to have about the, uh, the value of communities of practice. So for everybody listening now or, or later, um, it's a nice one because I can speak firsthand or yeah, speak at, at firsthand with some of the insight that Sui's going to share and uh, the incredible role that she plays in, in supporting coaches back in the UK. I will let her provide a little bit more of her story and, and background uh, momentarily, but obviously alongside me, Tom Shields, is Mr. Mark Wilson back in the hot seat after a, a little pause on Tuesday. Uh, so Willow, welcome back. Um, and everybody who's joining now, please feel free to use the chat function if you have questions throughout this, um, any conversation, anything that you might want to ask from from Sui, uh, we can obviously direct our attention to that uh, throughout the, the course of the conversation. Um, myself and Mark will, will obviously, as usual, fire some questions in Sui's direction as we uh, as we talk about the importance of communities of practice um, on or to coach development. So uh, that's obviously going to be where we spend most of the time today. So uh, Sui, thank you ever so much for joining us. If you could. Um, Please provide everybody with a little bit of a, of a background to you who may be less familiar um, with yourself and, and your journey. And uh, yeah, take it away. Oh, great. Um, firstly, thank you for having me. Uh, I think it was a, a phone call that I just put you on the spot a little bit and said I'd, I'd like to, to get on board and do a little bit of um, webinar uh, podcasts. It's obviously been the future for the last four or five months. So always nice to, to kind of be active even though in the current climate football's just about to restart so so thank you for having me um a little bit about myself um in terms of coaching experience i've been coaching now for 20 years so i'll let you kind of figure out how old i might be or might not be um and keep that as a secret but again it, it kind of fell into coaching and um, so all throughout my primary school, secondary school, loved playing the game of football. Um, and back when I was playing football, there was nothing really in the women's game. So no professional contracts, no kind of lifelong future in the game of playing. And it was only because I played for Hull City Girls where I fell into coaching and I started my career at Hull City Football Community. Um, you could say I learnt my trade. So birthday parties, Saturday mornings, holiday clubs, and, 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 and there was kind of the huge learning curves for me in terms of coaching because it was kids that didn't want to be there, kids that were sent to camps because it was free babysitting or cheap babysitting, and then you had the players that wanted to be there and uh, wanted to learn. So when we talk about differentiation, wow, I had to learn it all. Um, and I had six really good years at Hull City Football Community. It was brilliant. Um, again, again, some of my coaching qualifications. So that was pretty much where I learned my five to 11, let's say, skills in, in coaching and, and working with other coaches. And, and then my first taste of formal qualifications. And then from there, I, I shifted into the FA. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a program called the FA Skills Program, which ran for five years, and it was funded by uh, Tesco's and Aldi, which was great um, because the kids would say, "Do you work for Tesco?" And I was like, "No, it's just, it's on my badge, but they sponsor us." And that was that was again working in primary schools, but it was working with the teachers. So I shifted from working with players as much to then working with primary school teachers who at the time, newly qualified teachers, they roughly got about four or five hours training at uni, how to coach sport. So it was working with them to give them a qualification to deliver PE, uh, physical education in the primary school. And then obviously in the skills program, we did some mentoring with grassroots coaching. So we went to deliver some sessions and then work alongside um, perhaps newly qualified level one grassroots coaches and then those that aspire to, to kind of continue on that coaching journey. So again, um, there was a team of four of us um, in East Riding County FA, which is Hull, where I'm based. And then nationally, there was around 110 of us dotted all the way around the UK. Um, and again, five 
brilliant years uh, in that role. And then I, I wanted to get the taste of coach education because I was doing it in primary schools, doing it um, informally as a mentor with grassroots coaches. And the opportunity came where I could apply to become a coach educator for the FA, delivering level ones, the youth awards as they were a few years ago, and then level twos. So that for me then shifted from coaching players to coaching the coaches uh, and, and, and having that formal qualification that coaches come on and, then, and want to have and seek and learn. And then that fell into the role of what I'm currently in for the FA, which is county coach developer. So predominantly in the East Riding, deliver level one, level two, you wear for B. Um, and then away from that, it'll be the in situ support. So level twos in England and UA for Bs have currently changed how they assess coaches and it's not now back in their club. So as a coach educator, now I'll go into their own setting and give feedback based on who they work with, the age group that they work with. So it's relevant for that coach to really kind of value a little bit more rather than that whole put on a session on a level two with the coaches that are on the course um, and pretend that you're coaching five years old. So that's that's my role at the minute. Um, I wear many hats. I'm still playing. Well, I've got another season maybe behind me uh, for Hull City Ladies, which Tom, you had a few good years coaching. So you know what they're like in terms of the work rate. So I'm, I'm a player this season. So I've, I've stopped coaching them. Um, and I've just started to coach a men's side on a Saturday. So I'm still keeping my hand in, in coaching. So I find that's really important not to lose touch of the game. So yeah, so it's been a great, so far, 20 years of, of coaching and the formal, the informal stuff. And kind of to top it all off, I did a PG set and completed it last year. So I went back into education, which was very scary after having so many years off and just doing the, the practical element of football. Um, but again, it was at my comfort zone. I took quite a lot, well, a lot from it, and it helps me as a as a coach, a coach educator, as a player, and a reflective person as well. So, so that's me really, um, in a nutshell. Perfect. Well, obviously, it's it, it's also quite a modest uh, explanation. You uh, you skipped over the fact that obviously you're a UEFA license holder and that you've coached in the Super League, uh, the Women's Super League, and. Um, so obviously it's interesting because while this conversation is going to be grounded in coach development, coach education, obviously the practical experiences that you can bring. Um, and even now, obviously, you know, just referencing, you know, the fact that you're, you, you're going to kind of dip your feet into the, the men's side of the game. And, and obviously that you, you have the ability and the empathy of people working at every level based on the fact that you've done it yourself. Um, so it's, yeah, so it, it's, it's great. Thank you for that. Um, obviously what we'll, what we'll do, and you mentioned the PG cert, which I think was, was perhaps the time where the concept of communities of practice really didn't obviously begin to become apparent to you, but, but resonated just quite how kind of powerful and, and prominent, um, a role, you know, they, they could play in, in development and in obviously the, the professional role that you played while helping coaches to grow. So um, it's obviously a phrase that may be familiar to some, but, but unfamiliar to others. So if you could, Sui, um, just, just talk to us a little bit about, you know, what is a community of practice? Um, and obviously, you know, where were you first exposed to them? Was it at the footballing community? Was it, you know, was it at the FA? Was it when you were kind of in a, in a formal professional environment? You know, give us, give us a little bit of the backstory there. Yeah. Um, and again, it's about reflection and, I, I'll sit here and say I didn't actually know what community practice was 18 months ago. It was just a word that was part of this PG set that I was like, wow, what is this? Do I need to do some more research into it? And I guess you alluded to it a little bit when you said about, you was quite modest there, Suey, in terms of your coaching, your coaching badge, um, who you coach and stuff like that. And that was kind of my experience of, I left school and went straight into coaching. So I didn't do the, the university course, um, maybe because it scared me, maybe because back then, 20 years ago, it, it was more around working in apprenticeships than actually going to university. So when I talk about 
my my almost my past and my journey for me that is huge on what we call situated learning and communities of practice now I'm not gonna sit here and throw lots of academia in your in your faces because if you're like me you love the game and it's about being on the grass but in terms of what it is and I'll quote um, Wenger and um, trainer who who kind of have wrote many articles and research papers around community practice it's around a shared passion so believe it or not this this webinar and the, the conversations that you and I have Tom is a community of practice but maybe we didn't value it we just see it as oh, we're talking football but actually it goes much deeper but as long as it's got an outcome so community of practice is a shared goal a shared outcome and a passion for that sport that that career um that job in hand whatever it may be so for us community of practice we're coaches so we could then talk about coaching which is our community of practice but again it has to be challenged so we could talk about it but then what's the end value what do we want to get out of it so if we wanted to become more reflective coaches then actually our community practice would become how do we become more reflective as coaches and we could share ideas we could share experiences that have got us to that reflective point and again you may see communities of practice as informal which is false because actually communities of practice which we've done many a times on fa co coaching courses could be done in a formal setting so you come on a level two and we set a task that's a formal community of practice in that in that um, educational setting in the moment of the FA level two. But again, it leads to a qualification. So that informal, that formal chat on the level two community of practice, the common goal is we want to complete the level two and gain that qualification. But when the qualifications stop, that's how important these community practices are because then we get that motivation to check and challenge each other without the extrinsic factor of here is a qualification. Um, and again, community practice, it's got to be intrinsic. So when we talk about motivation, to be part of this community practice and share your thoughts, your, your knowledge, it's got to come within because you're not going to get any coaching hours. You're not going to get any cpd hours that give you 10 percent off at the nike store or, or an fa uh, england match ticket it's about what does it do for you and how does it help you in terms of where you want to get yeah and i think the the phrase that you've just used there like you know you're leaning on your peers or, or people around you to, to check and challenge yourself and each other so with with what you've said um obviously you've mentioned a little bit about reflection um Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming that there can be, you know, it's not just reflection that, that communities of practice will be beneficial for. So could you speak about, you know, what other opportunities, you know, engaging in a community of practice, establishing it and using a community of practice may bring to a coach's development? Yeah. And again, the word reflection at the minute, I don't know about you guys over there, but in England, it's very much a buzzword. I must reflect, I must reflect. But actually, what are you reflecting on? And if you don't get those key points of what is it that you want to reflect on? How do you want to get better? People just go, yeah, I reflect all the time. I ask my players if they enjoy it. And yeah, they said, yeah, so that'll do. But actually, that's, that's just a, a really kind of easy get out of, um, I'm, I'm a reflective coach because I ask my players if you enjoy it. It's very fixed, isn't it? It's a fixed conversation of, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, for coaches, we, we must have thousands of coaches through the level one, thousands of coaches through the level two, so badge collecting. Then the last couple of years, the FA has changed UA for B in terms of it used to be regional, so you'd have to apply. So for us in the northeast, you'd apply, there'd be 30 places, and perhaps you had 200 applications. You'd cycle through them, and if you was lucky, because obviously your coaching um, hours matched the course, you was on it. 
but then you have to, if you wasn't, you're waiting over a year. For the last couple of years, every county affair has run a UEFA B, which means 24 coaches every season in every county, and there's 42 counties, will go on their UEFA B journey and get the qualification at some point, okay? Now, for some, it might be after the 12 months, for others, it might be two years, three years, because again, it's, it's, it's where they fit on that journey. Then we say around, right, okay, there's a job in the academy. You need a UEFA B, minimum. So all those 24 coaches apply for that job, that same job. And their CV is quite robotic. I've got my level one, got my level two, got my UEFA B, bam. Oh, and I've coached a team for the last 10 years. That's it. So what we talk around with community practice is, well, what else do you put on your CV that will make you different from those other 23 coaches that want the same job as you? Because yes, you've got the qualification, which on an iceberg, there's your pinnacle. It looks good. But what's your deeper understanding? And how far do you want to go to get better and more knowledgeable and gain that experience? So we always talk about a coaching age. We, we talk about how old are you in your coaching age? So for me, I'm 20 years old. And my coaching age for my A license is three years. Now, what have I done since gaining my A license to put me different to the other 100 people that got the real license. And I think because coaching is now growing as a career, um, what puts the young coaches differently? Because yes, they get the badges. So how does a community practice help? Well, actually it's that intrinsic factor of, I've got my A license, but actually what I did with it is I went to go work at Doncaster Bells for a season and a half with the Super League, um, as one of the first team coaches. It wasn't a paid role because, again, not, there wasn't an awful lot in it. But, but what it did for me is then add things to my CV. So I got to observe, observe the, the, the first team manager who worked with the sports scientist and the psychologist to create plans for individual players that some were international um, and some were young developing players. So I got to experience that. I got to then coach international players. And that was all because I put myself out there to go, well, what puts me different? Because I need to be different. What was great about Doncaster Bells was again, that community of practice. So our common goal was to try and stay in the WSL one, even though it was very hard. Our passion was Doncaster Bells and football. And then what we did, we, we had to be open-minded to when we put on a session for those players, to gain feedback, not just from the players, but the other coaches. So I, I wanted the other coaches to watch me, to give me some feedback, whether it's in the car, on the way home, um, and it was an hour to Doncaster, so telling me there and then that, that, that feedback. Or it could be that we go and source some information. So we're playing Arsenal at the weekend. How do we then get three points or try not to concede? So the community practice there would be, Watch Arsenal, share some really good tactics of how they play in possession, out of possession, and then don't be afraid to check and challenge. So if a coach said, in possession, Arsenal do this, and I had a different lens to that, don't be afraid to say, well, actually, I saw this, this, and this, so I disagree with that. And don't take it personally. So that was our community practice. And for me, it helped in terms of not just resting on a comfort zone. I've got my A license. I, I deserve a job. No one deserves any job just by the badge that you've got. You've got to have that personality and that drive to go. Actually, it's not about the money. It's about getting as much information to make my, my foundations as strong as possible to put me in a better position for a role if it came up. So that would be the top end of a community practice. The, the, the grassroots end would be speaking to other coaches. So if you've, got a, if you've got a club, you coach six till seven at night, stay around seven till eight and watch the other coach work. Give him or her some feedback. Or ask the coach to come an hour earlier to watch you, which I don't think we do enough of. And that would really start to kind of delve into that, what did you think of my session? Did I miss anybody out? And give you a different lens on yourself. Um, 
Again, a community practice could include video. So record that coach working because people don't like to watch themselves back. So that's how I would deem a, a community of practice or to start off with is, yeah, brilliant, you've got your coaching badges, but what about that in between? So when we talk about the 70, 20, 10 rule, so 70% is experience, the 20% is that social interaction and the 10% is that formal course, that formal learning. So if that's only 10%, so if that formal learning is 10%, how do we make the most of that 70%, that 20%, that's, that's in different zones? And that's where those community practices can really support that. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And um, we had, I don't, to be honest, I don't know if Todd is much of a presence in, in the UK at the moment, but, but a gentleman called Todd Bean who runs a, He's Johan Johann Cruyff's son-in-law. Um, he runs an academy over in, in Barcelona. Um, and the Tovo Institute is his, um, is his coaching program. And, and Todd is uh, a bit of an enigma. You know, he's, he's very passionate about what he believes in and, and he's, um, is driven by a, a desire to change the game and move away from a more traditional kind of coaching environment and anyway what that means is that there's there's people who will challenge his viewpoints beliefs and I think you mentioned something that's incredibly important that when creating a community of practice as formal or informal as the two examples are that you've just given um, I think it's important that coaches recognize that by disagreeing with somebody's values or beliefs, it's not, you're not criticizing or disagreeing with them as a person, right? Them as a coach versus them as a person. It's kind of two different things. And being challenged on you know, your construction of a session or, or why you believe something to be a certain way, it's healthy, you know, it's, it's healthy debate, as long as another person can justify and rationalize why they maybe believe what they believe and how they would have done things differently. Um, and I think my, my question to you, so we just off the back of this is, you know, you mentioned that peer-to-peer -peer feedback is something that we're almost resistant of in our community, while in teaching it's common, right? Teachers are, are often asked to sit in a classroom and, and peer evaluate one another. Um, and I know we haven't really spoken about Beyond Pulse as a, and the, the tool that we have, um, and specifically the fact that coaches can reflect on their session and see how engaged players were and link back to ball rolling time and, um, directors of coaching, people in kind of my position where, where you're overseeing staff, you can have a conversation, an objective conversation based around, well, you know, when you used to get the stopwatch out to assess coaches, you've actually now got a tool that will say, this is how, in, this is, this is how engaged they were or were not. Um, so is it that people are apprehensive of feedback? Is it that maybe ego gets in the way? Um, you know, why, if, if you're speaking about the power of a community of practice to, to, to help develop a coach, especially if only 10% of their development is, as you say, in the formal kind of licensing setting, you know, you know, what, what would you implore the coaches listening to, to do? Um, and maybe you can tell the story about, you know, why you would go first on a coaching course. Yeah, I guess, I don't know if it's like just football coaching, but sometimes we do have this ego and as a naive coach starting out, um, 18 years old, I ran a girls team and I was the complete opposite of, 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 of what I am now. So it was about those girls at 12 years old, go out and win. But when they won, it felt like it was my victory because I was that, that coach of like, oh, my girls won today, 5-0, 3-0. And it, it gave you that ego boost when actually it's down to the players to perform on that day, but the coaching is down to you. And, and sometimes coaches like to build and I'm not, I'm, anyone can challenge me. Little armies, little kind of that ego of, these are my players. I can't, I'm not gonna send them to academies, they're brilliant. And I don't need to listen to any of our advice because I'm winning every week, which is fine. But we know in football, that the older you get in your coaching age, the more you experience, and actually that winning doesn't always happen. So when you don't win, that's a huge learning curve for that coach. And for those fixed mindsets of, of coaches, that's when you'll see that they'll mostly give up 
because like I know what ah, I'm not I'm not enjoying it I'm losing now so that's not really that play development that's about them that's about them as a person their reflection is the quite fixed mindset and they don't want to be supported and, and unfortunately you still get that on courses where they've played the game maybe a semi-pro and they don't need to learn anything else those coaches that have an open mindset it'd be brilliant for them to maybe see themselves with a different lens on so i would always and we had the discussion the other day when i was on the air license i wanted to deliver and yes it was never. I, I was nervous. I don't think I had anything for breakfast that day at St George's Park. I didn't speak to anybody. Constantly sweating, but I wanted to coach. I wanted to deliver because, rightly or wrongly, if my session was like a big fat cross, I was still going to get feedback, which would mean I could take that feedback to then develop myself more as a person. And. If, again, I had got some feedback which I didn't agree with, I made an environment with those tutors that I could ask, well, I don't, well I'll say I don't agree with that, and, but give them some rationale. And I think that's really important to have because there are some coaches that will go, I'm, all, I'm on the A licence, I don't want to deliver, they're not my players, I don't work with that age group, so there's no point in me delivering. Well, the power of delivering is the fact that you get feedback. And that was on that formal course, but actually there's opportunity to do it in your own club. And maybe we see coaching badges as a reason that we should listen to feedback. So just because I'm an A licensed coach, does that mean that everyone should listen to me because I've gone through the coaching badges? What happens if I had 20 years experience, but had a level two? Would my feedback, and my reflection and my observation skills too, let's say I'm watching you, Tom, would that be any different? But because I've got an A licence, so I could have gone through the same experiences. I'm a level two coach, but I've been at Doncaster Bells. I've volunteered here. I've gone to work abroad. I, I've, I've done over 10,000 hours, let's say, but I've only got my level two. And then I've got my UFA and done exactly the same journey. Would you value it more because I've got that pinnacle of a, an ear license? I think that's scary sometimes that we undervalue people that perhaps don't have that qualification but have got the experience. And maybe money or time or their own personal journey didn't allow for them to get on that ear license or B license. So don't be fearful of getting um, feedback or observation skills from somebody that maybe has just started out with coaching because what they may have is something that you've never seen in yourself and they may just ask a question that ignites something within you go do you know what i've never experienced and delivering as a coach educator delivering hundreds of level ones the idea is that coaches came to change a practice to make it harder or easier for a player was sometimes things that i as a coach educator didn't think of and I'd be like, brilliant, I'll use that on the next course to show to another learner. And actually, why not? Because our thinking will only have so much of a capacity. Whereas if we, if we borrow and share off other people and other people's ideas, then our growth will just expand. And that's a, that is a power of community practice. It, don't be afraid to get advice from somebody that's been in the game maybe two months because what they see may just add value to what you didn't see in yourself. Perfect. Well, I'm going to bring you in here because I think one of the things that we often maybe give you credit for behind your back, but never to your face is, uh, is the humility that as a player, obviously you spent, you know, a lifetime in the game at, at levels that many of us could only dream of, but yet displayed, use humility again, but the, the willingness to embrace people whose experiences were completely different from your own. Um, sometimes to, you know, to develop, as Sui said, sometimes to capture an idea that perhaps, you know, you'd maybe been less, exp or less exposed to based on the level that you'd worked at previously, the ability to connect with, with lower age players. So I'm just thinking because, you know, Mark, your the experiences that, 
that people like yourself and and your colleagues or teammates throughout your your playing career would have grown up with and, and that that ability to share to benefit others would be so significant but you know was it something that you were very deliberate and intentional about was it hard you know was it hard to take your you know to do what Sui says and be like okay well actually if I've played in front of 70,000 people who are you to tell like just talk to us a little bit about that because I, I think the ability to the ability for communities of practice to be become as prominent as they perhaps need to be in our industry people people in the position that you've been in could add so much value but they would need to display the type of mindset that you have and and not everybody does it so talk to us about about that a little bit i think there's a misconception that just because you've played the game for so many years at whatever level um you're prepared to go and coach people make them better uh lead coaching staff, educate coaching staff. And I'm referencing Sui, an experience I had when I left the game and came to New York City as a director of coaching. And I've said it many times, woefully unprepared uh, to manage people, to lead people, to educate people. Um, I thought I was prepared because I'd had, you know, 18, 19 years in the game at, at lots of different levels. And um, the information was in there. I just didn't know how to access it. Um, and what a wonderful experience to be around people who maybe haven't been in that elite level professional environment, but have a completely different perspective and viewpoint. Um, that really brought me out of this comfort zone I was living in, focused and centered on my own opinion of my journey. Um, that was a problem for me. So I had to step out of that comfort zone and, and fail quite a lot as a director of coaching, to be honest. Uh, and I think the glue that held me together during that three years was the ability to build relationships that were authentic, that were genuine. So that, that kept me in the mix um, as I was learning from others and, and starting to become more vulnerable and humble. And um, I met people like, like Tom, Michael Supp, who's a co-founder of Beyond Pulse, just two of many people that um, I learned from. I, le I learned about managing individuals, uh, taking a different viewpoint and perspective on the game, certainly learning about developing non-elite level players um, and connecting the dots when they start on their journey. Maybe they're late developers and how do you connect the dots to get them into the environment and develop them? The same with coaches. How do you take a, a coach who's starting out on their journey and, and get them to the level they, they want to get um, by talking to them, by understanding what they want uh, first and foremost and, and building a relationship with them. So that kind of leads me into a question for, for you, Siri. And in terms of communities of practice, when I think about how they're, they're there to serve, um, and I'll, I'll give a simple tagline. Let's say your community of practice is to help others achieve their end goal. Very simple tagline. What is the framework that you think should be in place or that is currently in place, let's say at East Riding, that helps people of all different levels and, and abilities and, and knowledge of the game come in to this community and get them to where they need to be because... The last point on this is when, when I think about um, me going out and evaluating a coach, I can evaluate them on that day based on their performance. But I want checkpoints of, hey, you want to be a top coach or a top manager for a college team in the US, or you want to be a USL head coach. So that, that piece of your journey is only one small piece. So unless I know from the beginning where you want to end up, I don't know how to help you or the checkpoints and measurables along the way to help you get there. So what kind of framework do you think should be in place and is in place right now? I guess the good thing with me is on level ones and level twos and UEFA B, um, their pre-course task is around for them in their journey. Hmm. Um, and again, in more detail. So if each one, they ask you for more detail, UEFA B, the map my journey um, pre-course task is, is really delving into who you've been coaching, where did you start, what do you want to get out of your UEFA B, what do you want to get out of the career. So I get the opportunity to to learn them on course. And whether it's a, a 10 minute conversation at lunchtime, I really make an effort to understand. Because like you said, Mark, it's huge to to know that learner, to know that coach, because if you don't know them, you don't know where they want to be. And you could give them the complete wrong information 
that will make them fall out of love of the game. Um, so we have parents on courses to then students that want to go and work in academies to then those that have played the game, come out of the game, and now they're coaching the Suns team. Uh, and like you said, they've got the information up there, but they can't then translate their information to a child because it, it's not relevant to their world. So what we tend to do in, in the course is first off, make those kind of conversations, whether it's an icebreaker, but again, I don't want to be too generic about the icebreakers, or sometimes it's just a, a, a conversation to a coach or with a coach on the way to the pitch around who is it you coach, why you get into coaching. With the technology that we have now, we've got quite a few platforms that we can then share with these, these learners, these coaches that we have. The big thing in, that we have is WhatsApp. Now, everybody wants to make a WhatsApp group. I must have 100 WhatsApp groups named level one, level two, whatever they want to. And, and that for me is a start of some of their sharing. Um, and you'll kind of get an understanding where that coach is in terms of their mentality because some will use that platform to ask if they want a friendly. Anyone want a friendly this weekend? You're like, it's not really for that, but do you know what? We're still talking football, so it's fine. Whereas some will then check and challenge around what was delivered on workshop one, workshop two, or has anyone seen this documentary? And the big one was Michael Jordan. Um, that was on Netflix during the lockdown and everybody was talking about it. And for me, that was some real good learning points in terms of that community practice, because we're talking about then player led and how actually it's around giving some autonomy to, to players and how they could do that in their own team. So the use of WhatsApp is, is, is one of those informal tools that they all have and everyone's got on the phone. So for some who are perhaps parents, full-time job, don't give that many hours to learning because of three kids, a husband, a wife at home, whatever, that platform is just sometimes to check in, just to kind of go over. For others, you kind of, they, they will lead those discussions. So then all of a sudden you're out on the outside, I'm going, oh, Tom's leading that discussion quite well. Then it might just be a, Tom, love what you said in the group, fancy a chat for a little bit more, more detail around what you're saying. So it could be then I pick up the phone to Tom, or he calls me and we have that little bit more of an in-depth conversation of well, where do you want that discussion to and how will that help you as a coach? Um, so, so that's one way of doing it. Um, and again, really basic. The next way that has kind of developed over the last five months is Zoom, is Teams, where it's like this. And we get a cup of tea because we like that in England, cup of tea, maybe a couple of biscuits. And we just talk football. And it might be something, somebody might have a topic that they want to talk about and we'll dedicate an hour to that topic. So it could be session planning. It could be um, working on the, the social and psych of that player and how, how to work with differentiation or different abilities. And it, it, it goes and it gathers momentum from there. So if they can lead it and I can drop in a little bit as a coach educator, Brilliant, because that shows me that they've got that little bit more leadership and autonomy that they want to develop and they want to find themselves a little bit more. Um, and then again, it could then go on to that we, we hold a coaching session based on our conversations. We then hold a coaching session in that club and then we see it brought to life. So we see the, the discussions that we have right now then brought to life on the football pitch and then we, we start to have engaging conversations there so it's not for everybody and like you say you kind of know by talking to that coach around what they want so you can so you can give them the right feedback and not throw too much in so they go into that panic zone and then you can find out those that really are more interested and want to dig a little bit deeper and check and challenge them that's can i just follow up what, just no, quickly not allowed i think that's a really Good explanation and, and you know processes that can really support and help you know any learner that's coming into your environment and just to be really current and relevant I want to touch on the last dance Michael Jordan uh, because to me I think that throws a hand grenade into the very traditional um, mindset 
of, of coaching currently. Um, I thought it was one of the best documentaries, but for reasons that really challenged the traditional methods or the more what appear to be open-minded methods. Yeah. But when you look at them and you look at what they did, two three-peats, three NBA championships twice, and you look at the dynamics of both of those groups of players and how Phil Jackson managed that, it goes against the grain. It really goes against the grain of what we think is innovative. Um, when really, I think when you compare and contrast, what we do now is actually very traditional compared to what they were doing back in the 90s. Yeah, and there's always a danger that you watch that documentary and you get the copycat coaches to go, well, if it's good enough for Phil Jacks, what we're going to do is we're going to copy that exactly philosophy that he had to then win us this. You've got to be realistic about who you coach, how many hours you get to spend with those players, and actually what's around you in terms of budget. Mm -hmm. And then we have to look at, well, the players that we work with at the minute, they're coming from a different generation where they're exposed to quick fixes. So if they want an answer, they'll go on Google or YouTube or whatever. So that traditional approach sometimes, well, may not work because the players that are coming through don't have that resilience. But you look at the players that he worked with, they, were, they all had that resilience. They didn't have that give up and just took it away and when times got tough, just walk out. It was, it was inbuilt with that resilience, that drive, that intrinsic factor. Don't get me wrong, some of them, it was about the money as well. But do we become, do we become managers of the game like he was? And around Sir, Sir Alex Ferguson is a great example. He can manage people. He can manage egos. He can, again, disagree with me, but he can manage players. And for me, isn't that coaching as well? Being able to understand your players and what drives them and then piecing it all together. Is that the same as making coaches piece things together? What drives a coach? The traditional business model would tell you uh, leadership and management are different, right? Leadership is you are, you are creating the vision, you are delivering the mission, and you are inspiring people to buy into your culture, and managing will be the process, i.e. coaching. So at the minute, in, in the business world, they separate leadership and management. One is process-driven, one is vision-driven. Um, and I agree with you. Ferguson wasn't a fantastic coach, but he was a wonderful leader, one of the best. And he, he inspired. And it, uh, there's actually a quote here that I want to read you just quickly, and then I, I promise I'll shut up um, and let Tom take, take over. Um, here we go. Average leaders raise a bar on themselves. Good leaders raise a bar for others. Great leaders inspire others to raise their own bar. And that sums up Ferguson, and that sums up, sums up Phil Jackson from what I could see in that documentary so for me I'm, I'm i'm on the fence about what i believe a coach a manager and a leader is but i do think in in circumstance context uh situation you mentioned earlier situational learning and adapting to that i do think they're separate sometimes as well yeah and again it, that, that, but that's football isn't it because it's based on experiences and it's based on perhaps your own philosophy. We, we had a discussion around winning. So just before we, we came live, we said around winning. And for some reason, winning is a, a dirty word at the minute because, again, in the culture, it's about taking part. And don't get me wrong, it is because the experience. So as a coach, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're under eight, win or lose at the weekend because they are developing. But it, it's a nice to win and it's maybe a, byproduct of your coaching and your environment that will help you to, to win. Hull City Ladies, the, the team that last season I coached for, we was at the bottom of, of the league. We needed to win. So when we talk around that leadership and that management, I didn't, well, we didn't actually care if we played poor and got three points because those three points kept us off the bottom of the table. So when we talk about situational learning as well, because everyone's like, well, I'd rather, I'd rather play really well and lose. And 
not in the, not in that game because playing well and losing doesn't get you three points. But in the younger age groups, playing well gives you something then to talk as a discussion point and it, 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 it's a long-term player development. And that's what we need coaches to look at. And that's why if we can get coaches to experience, not just mini soccer, but winning and losing in the men's game, the female game, to then have that plan A, plan B, plan C, because it, it's real, isn't it? Football is real. And if we just have coaches that, develop players and have a nice philosophy and get really good feedback. But what happens when they go in the real, not the real game, but the game where it's worth three points and money and league statuses? Have we prepared that coach enough in perhaps courses, in feedback that we give them, that what happens when they lose and they're sitting at the bottom of the table? Um, I think it's... it's in it's really valuable conversation and I, I want to try and pull it together by speaking about mentor mentee relationships and how they have a place obviously as an independent community of practice, but can tie together an awful lot of the, the conversation discussion that you guys have just had. So, um, I forget, Willow, you might be able to remind me one of our guests spoke about the power of books and that, the best thing somebody can do is read a book because it's that author's 20 years of experience into one place. So within a month, I can learn the information that took somebody else 20 years to figure out. And I think a lot of that transcends into mentor-mentee relationships and how powerful they can be in community of practices because, you know, what you've, what you've just spoken about, um, yes, you can't exchange time the experience that you get with boots, you know, your boots on the grass, going and doing the, the hard yards. Um, but it's great if somebody else has already gone through it at every level that you could possibly dream of and still be able to, to provide some form of framework and reference point to your experiences and, and guide and support you. Um, so why, beyond what I've just said, and why, Sui, would you encourage, as you, as you do regularly, people to, to be humble enough to, to go and find a mentor, to be, to be humble enough to do as you've done, as I've done, um, as many who reach the top do at some point in their journey and volunteer their time to be around an environment that perhaps they're, you know, they otherwise would have been, would have been sheltered from, you know, why would you go and search out people who can, you know, push and challenge you um, and provide you with, you know, the, the type of perhaps framework that perhaps understanding, um, perhaps sounding board that you would need to be able to, you know, to kick on and elevate yourself to the, the kind of levels that you guys have just been speaking to? First, I would encourage it has to be the right mentor because we have different values and beliefs. That is just us as a, as a person. And there will be clashes, but you've got to find the right mentor. And when we talk about learning to drive, and it might be off topic, but when we learn to drive, you've got to have a connection with that driving instructor because you trust them to teach you to learn to drive. And then you have a go, you get some feedback. So why is in that environment, that's okay to have that mentor experience but then it comes to football and we we kind of become so protective that we don't want it but if it's if, if it works for us to learn to drive use that as the same driving force to then go well i need to find a mentor to to help me experience these coaching journeys and to bounce off and if i cliche if i knew now is that right if i knew now what i didn't know then i I'd be in a different place, but actually maybe I had to experience those mistakes and those setbacks to then become more humble and understanding around the coaching and the power of coaching and the development of players and where they may be. I think we sometimes get sidetracked by success and by badges and having a mentor gives you that honest, but like-minded conversation that maybe you don't have all the time. 
And certainly, like you said, if you can take 20% of what a mentor is saying to you, it's going to help you against somebody else that doesn't have that 20% extra. But like you said, it's got to be the right mentor because it could have an adverse effect where you could fall out of love with the game. They don't understand you as a person. So I certainly won't want anybody on this, watching this to go, right, these guys have told me to get a mentor, pick up the phone and go, we be my mentor. It's got to have that connection. It's got to have that, that patience and that time to build those relationships to then have that trust. I yeah. think that's the biggest thing is, do you trust the person that you're talking to and bouncing ideas off? Yeah, and being authentic, well, always a word that we've characteristic that we've discussed a lot, right, over the last kind of four months, authentic, genuine, um, you know, and have the capability to, to have an honest conversation and, and your relationship is formed from that, right? Because the last thing that you want is somebody to, you know, to be afraid of providing you the type of feedback that perhaps you, you need in your journey. Um, the next piece of that, though, Sui, that, that I kind of scribbled down as you were speaking about your WhatsApp group, is the power of potential mentors or peers that you that you um, uh, your peer to peer network, but but in more in, in broader terms, the network that you can develop through various communities of practice and in the industry that we're involved with, the, the power that, that that can have on opening doors. Um, and we speak to players, especially in the US, that are aspiring to, to go off to college and, uh, you know, regularly being scouted about, you never know who's watching and you never know when somebody's watching. And my message to the coaches would be that it's very similar, especially as a young aspiring coach, you never know, you know, who through one degree of separation, you know, we could be speaking to about you. So Sui, when you mentioned somebody takes a leadership group in a WhatsApp group and he's like, Oh, actually, well now in that candidate class of 30, they're separating themselves. So now when I get asked, you know, do you know anybody who might be a good fit for this or that? You know, the power of networks are based upon people that you develop relationships with and can trust. And therefore, in our industry, you would you would recommend because your reputation is important because I wouldn't, you know, none of us want to recommend a dud. Nobody wants to, to do a disservice to the kind of hard yards that he or she has put into building a reputation for themselves. Um, so can you speak, you know, just a little bit about that as well? And you know, if people are sat here and like, oh, well, yeah, it might be nice to have something to bounce ideas off of, or it might be nice to have a support group, or actually, yeah, that chat at the pub, I could note that down and, and maybe reflect a little bit more on it. But, you know, when people invest in, in professional courses with the aspiration to elevate themselves professionally, you know, it, it isn't, it clearly can't just be that, that certificate that's 10% of their formal development that's going to get them through a door. Um, so, can you maybe speak a little bit about, about the power of that and, and networking um, and how that can support development as well? Yeah. Uh, and again, I think all three of us sit here and, uh, and are quite big advocates of networking because football is, is such a, a huge part of our lives. But there'll be two people that, you're, you, that you'll know that will know that person. So I could say, do you know Tom Shields to a coaching hall? And somebody might say yes, or somebody might say no, but actually my friend does because he works with him. And so you're always kind of in the limelight in, in a fashion. In terms of bias, I, know, I don't know how you guys are, but I sometimes look at coaches that I see myself in and go, wow, like I, I, I like what they do. I like how they coach. And that's your, that's your bias. You can't help that. So I tend to look at coaches on courses and go, you'd make a good mentor because I see a little bit of myself in that, that, that coach, rightly or wrongly. Um, but again, it's, it's then highlighting that and then giving them the confidence to lead. So what I may do in, like, on the course is I might set some tasks where that coach leads that group and that discussion and then collates the feedback. Um, and the way that they feed back and that, that kind of discussed to me, I, I try and use voice notes or filming because I, I just feel spider graphs and flip chat is, is kind of just bubbles of words and it becomes more personal if it's a voice note or a video. So I always try and use stuff like that as a, 
as a reminder to, to reflect on themselves. But in terms of picking mentors, you may be a mentor and not realize it. And the power that you can leave to somebody after a discussion could be huge on that person to, to give them self-confidence, not realize it. And a 10 minute turn up early and watch the end of a coaching session before you start and just giving them some feedback and go, do you know what? I like that. Might just give that coach more confidence. So look, it's hard because ultimately a lot of the coaches in England and the volunteers of the game. And so to give up an extra half an hour to watch somebody else when they don't really know them is quite difficult. But if they've got the passion and the understanding of and the drive of to support other coaches in the game, then I'd highly recommend it. Um, and again, it, it doesn't have to be that formal. It can just be, say, WhatsApp, but then how much do you get out of it? How much? And whatever you want to put in, you'll get the returns. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, last kind of, I guess, formal question from me. Um, obviously, we, we've kind of referenced that communities of practice are great for shared experience and great for sometimes advice and guidance. So to anybody that is listening to this now or, or later, um, you've obviously been a, both a candidate and an instructor on probably at this point, hundreds of elite level coaching licenses. Um, obviously we've, we've spoken about the willingness to, to be brave enough to go and harness feedback. And I think what interesting, what, what you didn't explain in this one that you, you did to me on the phone was that your decision there was based on when I'm in my group, I get feedback from one instructor. When I deliver in front of the full group, I get in feedback from three or four. Right. And, and the power of that is, is significant, but, um, obviously putting your, your assessor hat on your, your educator hat on. Um, do you have any closing advice for people on how they could both, you know, well, how they could prepare for those experiences to benefit from them to the best of their ability? You know, are there any things, any pitfalls that you usually see that you would encourage people to, you know? Yeah. Um, so on, on the, on the new courses, um, on the FA level one, level two, when we talk about the feedback, what, what we've actually been doing is getting the coaches to feed back to the coaches that I've just delivered. So whereas before it was that the coach educator would give the feedback to, let's say, yourself, Tom, what, what we're looking at now is we put them in groups. So um, coach one would deliver. Coach two and three would give feedback around certain aspects. So what we try and get them to look at is what is it you're going to feed back on? So share, share your learning outcome. That's the biggest thing. So the advice is if you want someone to come and observe you or if you want to be a mentor, find out what their coaching practice is, first and foremost. What is their learning outcome? So if their learning outcome is dribbling, let's say just really holistically dribbling, well, start to write some, some questions around how often do they dribble in that session? Is there opportunity to dribble? Does it look real? So if you're dribbling around 12 cones, does that look like the game on a Saturday morning? So these are the stuff where you can kind of some really basic stuff to, and maybe give it to a parent. If you haven't got a coach coming to watch you, if you've got a great relationship with parents, point out some questions. Say, look, we're going to look at dribbling today. Can you let me know? It, does it look like the game? So when the players are dribbling and dribbling past defenders, does it like, look like a game? And they'll mostly just give you a yes or no answer. But that's a starting block if you've never actually had feedback before. Then start to look at, right, I've got some feedback from parents. How do I now source a mentor to help me push on further? Could it be someone from the course that you, was you got on really well with? Could it be um, that you, you get back in touch with a tutor? So gone are the days where you come and do a level two and you're not supported. If you come on a course, you'll, you'll be supported still. And that door is always open for the coach to pick up the phone to the coach educator and say, I did my level two a year ago, I'm, st I'm stuck. So do you have contacts with your old tutors or your coach educator that when you did your course, it could be that you went to a convention. So I know that you guys go quite often to the conventions in America. Did you make contacts there? So if you have, 
but you might not understand it, but that's massive in terms of your learning experience because you've got like-minded people that have gone out of their way to, to go to a convention. So straight away, you've got that common thread, then start to ask questions. So if you're a grassroots coach or, or no experience in mentoring, start to populate your own questions that you may give to parents or people that are watching. So if it's dribbling, does it look real? Do my players have opportunity to dribble? How do I speak to the players? Is it in the same context of everyone look at me and copy me or do I use question and answer? There could be some really easy questions to get someone to fill in for you. Then it could be um, touching base with another club coach at, at, at where they are. So if it's you, Tom, you might get in touch with Mark and go, do you mind coming down half an hour early? just to, to watch me because a fellow coach or do you know what do you mind having a coffee afterwards because I've got some questions around how you became the coach that you you are and what did you have to give up or um, push aside to, to be successful as you are now so those con open conversations will help and then it's again finding the right person so if you want to aspire to work in an academy or to be a director of football somewhere go ask go go, go source out those people whether it's on Twitter, because Twitter is a great tool, and ask those probing questions. What did you do to get here? How long has it taken you? Okay. Don't ask the questions, how much do you get paid? Do you get to wear the, the badge all the time? Ask the questions that will help you benefit. Who did you coach? What age group? How many hours did you spend on the grass each week? How do you, how do you manage different players? Go ask those questions, but go find it. If you're interested more, again, on community practice and uh, things like that, I've got um, a PowerPoint. Now, it's only three slides. I don't know if I can share my screen because I'm used to Microsoft Teams, but I'll have a go. You can share your screen. And I've, and I've just put some reference points in there in terms of go and have a read of a couple of research papers to maybe help you understand a little bit more around maybe the benefits to help you. Um, Should yeah, the, the green share screen option should be at the bottom for you. Yeah. There we go. And and this is how I how I deem my journey as a as a coach. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So some of you might be listening today and go, oh my word, what is all those words that's just been banded about? I'm just a football coach. I talk football. That's it. All these words that you see is like, well, they're big words. I don't understand them. Well, actually, they're not scary. It's part of your development. And if we can unpick those and, and be open-minded to peer learning, formal, informal, um, reflection, if we can open our minds to those, it will help us. And 12, 18 months ago, some of those words, pedagogy, scared me half to death. I'm like, no idea. I can't even say the word, let alone spell it. But if you really want to, to kind of have a greater understanding of yourself and the game and, and as a reflective coach and, and practitioner, go find those words and, and go research it and then put it into your own context. What does it mean to you? I always I use this as as a great example around you're smiling, Tom. We've seen this many times. I have indeed. I use it too. Everyone just sees coaching A to B. A is level one, B is level two. Smooth as that, as easy as that. Do one badge, get the next. I'm cliche, but I, I'm the bottom one. I'm here. I'm that mess in between. Because that mess in between is all my coaching experience and all my discussions and I was on the phone, I was on email, I was on Zoom or Teams as it has been for the last five months. That's me. And I'm not, I'm not afraid and I'm not ashamed to show it because if any, any coach wants to be the top one and you've had that, then please let me know and let me know when your book's out because I need the answers really quickly because I didn't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still finding coaching not in a straight line. It is a mess. And you'll have highs and you'll have lows and you'll get feedback that will make you feel like you're the worst coach in the world. But if you can be open to a point with that feedback, then it'll, it'll give you a greater depth of understanding. 
But that doesn't mean that every feedback that you get given from a mentor or for a coach educator is right. And I'm not saying that I'm always wrong or right, but it might not just fit, it might not fit you as a person because of your journey. And your values and beliefs might be different and we might just clash, which is fine. But have that open conversation and, and, and do it. And, and again, for those then people that again have gone, football? What we were just talking about, kicking a ball about and, and whatever else. There's some great reads there. And I've, I think I must have read each paper maybe five times for it to actually sink in and then Google some big words. But do you know what? I'm, I'm not afraid to say that because that's just my learning journey. But don't be put off by the big words. Google it, read it again, read it again, uh, and just get that great knowledge and understand that. Do you know what? Even if you're in the football and you've played for years and then you've coached, you've actually been on a, a qualified journey. You might not have a, a degree yet or whatever else, but the journey that you've been on is that of that situated learning and it adds so much value to where you've been and how you've learned the game and coaching. But don't be afraid to, to stop collecting the badges and start just reading, like you said, and read a book. Two things jump out of me there by Gotsky. Is that zone of proximal development? So you just said that, that big word, and that was part of my um, 4,000 word essay around, that, around interaction. So you're learning development. Yeah. How is learning... Is learning part of a development process? Can you learn and develop at the same time? I remember reading a little bit about Vygotsky in terms of the, the scaffolding, in terms of learning and getting individuals to that zone of proximal development. It, it, I haven't read a lot on Vygotsky, but it is interesting reading. The second one, epistemology is a really interesting read. Yeah. Um, to do with epistemology, I don't know how I feel about it, and it's a much longer conversation, but um, I've had a number of debates uh, about the theory, the theory behind epistemology. That, um, the naive yeah. coach and the sophisticated coach. <laughs> and what gets you to each one? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, there's some good reading there, for sure. Yeah. But also, uh, Vygotsky and his theory of social constructivism as well is... Mm -hmm. Anybody that likes coaching through games and why games are used, go and learn a little bit about constructivism because it will provide an understanding, a theoretical base to why it's so heavily encouraged. Games, game, that, that could be a conversation, games-based activities because um, we, we bang that drum perhaps a little bit too much. And coaches now, and especially in this pandemic, which has been really interesting, because they haven't been able to play games, sometimes coaches have forgotten the technical. So that little bit of repetition, of passing, of dribbling, that technical information, they've just gone, let's put on a game. Let the game be the teacher. So it's been really interesting to find out that actually sometimes we may not have given enough, the coaches enough information to help them support players technically. Sure. Because we've been, we've been very much of games-based activities. Go play a game, learn the game. Yeah. Interesting how you just last thing from me. Um, I always describe myself as a non-academic, and I believe that, but it doesn't mean to say I so don't do I. hate myself. So do I. <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, there's a traditional academic pathway. Um, that's very linear. Education is such an all-encompassing journey for me. Um, so if you're a coach out there and you know, certainly over here, there's, there's a big thing about having to go to college and, and going to college is a, is a must, but don't just see that linear academic pathway towards your degree as the only way to educate yourself. There's many more yeah, ways. I guess that was, that, that's, my, that's my background. And I'm sure you guys are the same in terms of my academic came when I was started at 33, going back to uni. Or when I say going back, I never, I've never been to uni. So at 33, that was my challenge. But I wouldn't have been able to complete my PG set if it wasn't for the experience of all that situated learning that took place, which I believe was very informal, turned out to be quite formal and educating and not even, there was no rubber stamp to it. Just So yes, education is important, it, it is, but so is experience and so is that social aspect of 
to, to love in the game. Yeah, Sui, um, I think that's a, a very nice way to, to round it out. Oh, um, Caesar, I can see that you've raised your hand. I'm going to allow you to talk if you have a question really quickly. So let's see. You hear me now? I can hear you, Caesar. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you very much. It's been a very nice hour listening to you and your experience and ideas. Um, please allow me to ask this question because you were pointing out about that thing about can you learn and develop at the same time. And I read a lot about the cognitive part of the training. Uh, I like to read a lot about Francisco Cirulo and all of these aspects of involving the, 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 the training and the, the relation with the, the cognitive development of the individual and the training partial or portion of the of the development of the player. Uh, and, and working in, in, in our context here in the United States, I had noticed uh, serious deficiencies in terms of cognitive development in many of our players. Uh, you were talk, also talking at the same time like in terms of you, you navigate into those waters of winning and losing, you know, the competitive aspect of any sport. But then you also get that conflict or that dilemma into what develop, actually development is. And then uh, in terms of these deficiencies, for example, that I have experienced myself in first person with the group of people that I've been working with, uh, and from your perspective, uh, the, the, how important we should it should be this into the into the design of our training units, even in, into the design or the building of our own philosophy as coaches uh, in regards to development and the and the actual responsibility that we have in terms of what the development means in players that have this type of deficiency and the the the, 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 in the way that we can help them improve and go to the, probably on a level where they will be more competitive for the aspirations. A cognitive perspective, Caesar. So yeah, how yeah. important is cognitive development? Cognitive development, uh, uh, Francisco Zidul, I, I, I had to just forget my English, mom. I have an accent and, and I, had to, I had to fight with my brain sometimes to yeah, so. <laughs> to translate because a lot of the, some of the terminologies is written in Spanish and sometimes gives me a hard time to translate it into English. But they talk a lot about the simulated uh, simulated uh, simulated preferential situations in the game, and then the, the Doctor Cerulo he says that um, he talks about that uh, when you're gonna implement a training unit if the player has certain deficiencies in his cognitive development no matter how much effort we put into it some of those technical aspects that you were talking before that we had this tendency for getting the technical aspects so some of those technical aspects will not be developed accordingly so then he says that it is important for in the, in the teaching process in the learning process that with those younger ages players to focus a lot into what is really need according to the cognitive moment or, 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 or the development. So then that match what should be reflected into the technical development of the play. That's pretty much what it is. Yes, um, the way that I, I, I understand it is between, so we've got the youth development phase and the, the foundation phase in football. So five to 11 foundation phase in, in the UK it's around understanding their capabilities and, um, and what they can perhaps absorb in that age and stage of development. So trying to give them sessions to help them make decisions will then help them in their problem solving as they're older. So something that might help you is around setting sessions up where they may have to problem solve so you don't give them the answer. So especially with the younger ages. So we talk around that, that cognitive kind of memory and, and support and, and information. 
set them tasks which perhaps get them to discuss with their peers and then think about the right questions to ask so that they develop and learn as a player so instead of going really basic example tom i want you to pass to mark because a defender's coming to get get the ball yeah brilliant you can do it not a problem but there's very little learning taking place and the development is is kind of it will stop there because there's no learning there's nothing to develop because tom doesn't think that he's done anything wrong or right he's just done what he's been told so it could be tom when you see a defender how could you use mark then it gets them to think about well actually i could use him so the defender doesn't get the ball that's that learning process then it might be the age and stage of they can tell you that they've they know that to pass a ball to to mark but they might not be able to do it psychologically yet because they're not at that age where they can process and then show that technical skill but because you've embedded that learning of but when someone comes and tries to tackle me i'll try and pass it to mark okay put them in a situation what perhaps then in coaching gives them opportunity to repeat that cycle and eventually when they can they're at an age and stage of that learning development they will then implement the psychological technical and physical aspect to then show you that understanding does that give you is that along the right terms tell me you guys if i'm yeah off- I, I agree. I, I think, so. You, you're right on point with how you've, you've delivered that. And just to add a, one more piece from my perspective, um, learning and performance are very different. And again, I'm, I love quotes and research in certain things. Uh, learning refers to relatively permanent changes in knowledge or behavior compared to performance. Performance consists of temporary fluctuations in knowledge or behavior that can be measured or observed during or shortly after instruction. So if you're looking at performance as an indicator of learning, it can give you the wrong indicators. So somebody can deliver on a rehearsed pattern, right? So if you rehearse a certain passing pattern and then you see it in a game at the end of your practice, uh, you might go, oh, he's learned something or she's learned something. Not necessarily because it's only over time if you measure the consistent response and the consistency of how that player is able to implement those certain technical, tactical, psychological kind of elements. You can be very misled by performance. And I know, Sue, you touched on it, wins, losses, you know, in the moment judgment of of young players. Um, And also you've got 18 to 20 players who will all be at different phases, ages and stages of learning. So for me, the cognitive fidelity, flexibility, and adaptability starts with the coach. You create the environment, and it's important that you don't look at the top end of your group as the measuring stick and then say, well, my late developers, well, you're lacking something cognitively. Maybe you're not. It's just joining the dots and you delivering a part of an activity that includes them, not your top five or six players, to give them that moment of success that helps them move forward. So... Hopefully, Caesar, between Sui and I, you've made some notes and there's not too much in that to, uh, to confuse you. The, the best example that I've got uh, from coaching was there was a, I think he was about 11 years old and passionate dad on the top uh, balcony. Pass a ball, switch it, switch it, constantly switch it. Jake, switch a ball, switch a ball. So it was, but it was constant and the intentions was good because he could see something that his son didn't, but at 11, he didn't. So we got his dad down. We've got Jake. Jake, why do you switch the ball? My dad told me to. Okay. Is that all? Yes. So there was no learning taking place. The question would be to remove his dad. Would Jake be able to see that picture, an opportunity of when to switch the ball and when to cross it? More than likely, no, because there's no learning taking place. So that was really big for for the dad to go, well, actually, we want Jake to be able to see an opportunity of there's a gap, there's a space, there's less people on the opposite side. I'm going to try and switch it. If the ball doesn't get there, I need to work on my physical strength. But actually, it's that cognitive and that football memory that will help him learn and develop as he goes on. So that's maybe one 
one thing, Caesar, for you is if you want your players to, to learn a little bit more, it's around asking those questions. Rather, I'm not saying that you do this, but rather than go in being quite prescriptive and go in pass, pass, switch, switch, shoot, let them make their own decisions. And if they make the wrong one, maybe three or four times, there's your coaching point. That's when you can step in and go, actually, might need to help you here because you're not seeing what everyone else can see. Yeah. No, perfect, guys. I, I would close with that. I think, uh, Willow, the, the example that you gave about patterns being replicated in short term, I think learning is typically, you can judge it based on repeatability of action and within a different context than it was initially taught as well, right? So patterns being produced immediately after they've been taught, yeah, you probably would see, you probably expect to see, in fact, that be done a little cleaner than a session that was more player centered and you know from a, a guided discovery kind of element in in that maybe one to two to you know a couple of sessions next half an hour next hour but in a month's time and in three months time and in a year's time you know what are the habits tendencies actions awareness scanning capabilities decision making you know tools that the players have you you know it's that's where you would see the differentiation. So, it's um, almost consciously, isn't it, Tom? It, it's not even a, a, a thought process anymore. It's that sure. recognition. Like you said, sure. Mark, you don't even think about it. You just do it. It's an action that you've just taught yourself because of situations. Yeah. So, listen, um, we've been selfish again with time. Um, it just keeps going. So, Sui... Um, We'll, we'll close it there and just say, obviously, a, a huge thank you from myself and Willow and the rest of, uh, of Team Beyond Pulse um, on behalf of the people listening now and, and in the future, obviously, for sharing um, a generous amount of your Friday evening with us. Um, as you said, last Fat Friday, last one before the, the gym's open again. So it's even more uh, more appreciated that you've chosen us to uh, yeah to, to pass your time with. So thank you so much. It was wonderful, uh, wonderful hearing from you and, and gaining your insight just to just to close, um, obviously, you know, a U.S. audience might have uh, a little less familiarity with you. So if, if people want to kind of, you know, check in or, or follow some of the work that you're doing, um, can, you, can you tell us how they might be able to find you? Yeah, so I, I think that the, the easiest one would be on Twitter. Um, so it's Sui underscore Smith. That's as easy as that. Um, and again, I do believe you tagged me in some of your, your tweet. You did tag me in some of your tweets so they could get on to uh, Beyond Pulse, um, click on them, and then obviously my Twitter's handles there as well. And if anybody wants to kind of share some more of their coaching journey, drop me a DM. Um, I said I'm happy to, to give some more support or just to, to find out a little bit more around what the coaches across the water are up to in lockdown that's always nice to know as well yeah it's definitely been uh what what month are we in i don't even know we started trying to count weeks at one point and then gave up about week 17 i think we gave up on doing weeks so i don't know where we are um but no look thank you so much it's been it's been wonderful um really do appreciate your, your time and your insight so on behalf of, of everybody here thank you again and, and to those listening now or or later again thank you guys so much for for choosing Beyond Pulse as your, your dose and source of, of education. And we, uh, we look forward to you all joining us again soon.